Hey, good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Yeah, so this is happening. My name is Pastor John. If you don't know who I am, I'm one of the pastors here at South Valley, and I get the opportunity to share God's Word with you this morning. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Uh, Pastor Ricky is in Nashville this morning. He is at the church that we have been uh, helping to get planted over in Nashville that we started uh, raising money for at the beginning of the year. Uh, so again, just as, as we go before the Lord and we bring our tithes and offerings every week, we want to remind you that it's not only here, it's not only in this community, but it is even across the world. It's even across uh, our nation that God is working. So uh, Pastor Ricky is going to give you an update when he comes back next week. But we want to be in prayer for Cross and Crown Church and Pastor Chris Tomes. Uh, they're launching today. Pastor Ricky's there, and it's going to be an exciting time. So today we're going to be looking at the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And I want to give you a little idea. That is the verse that talks about salt and light. And so I want to challenge you this morning that as we come into this time where we're looking at God's Word, you probably have heard about this verse a lot. You probably have a preconceived notion about this, this idea, and there's some truths to probably what we've heard. But I want to challenge you that if you're someone who's heard this verse before, to just tune in with me, because I'm going to look at it maybe a little differently than, than what we're used to. And if I make you cock your head to one side like I'm not sure what you're saying, please just bear with me. Again, this is my first time doing this, so, you know, you guys are going to be a tough crowd. Um, if you've never heard this verse before, if you've never heard this verse before, uh, we want you to understand the depth of what Jesus calls us to be as believers in Christ, and also the depth of how much God loves you that he would send his son for you to have a relationship with you. So we're going to be looking at that. And uh, I want to also just challenge you that I know last week, um, it might have been a little overwhelming because there was a huge math lesson involved in the sermon, so you may be recuperating from that. I don't have any math, science, or core subjects at all, uh, so that's okay. So we're good, right? All right, so uh, let's, get, let's get started uh, this morning by bowing our heads and going to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. We thank you for an opportunity to be here, to be with you. You've brought us here just to be uh, in community with each other, Lord. And we thank you for an opportunity to lift our voices in song and give you praise. We pray now that you would go before us, that you would be here and speak to our hearts. When we look into your word, Lord, pray that you would speak to each one of us in a unique way that only you can, that you would draw us into your presence. And again, we would be changed from the inside and just be changed that when we go out in the world around us, we could be used by you in a mighty way, Lord. So go before us and be with us in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this is, the, this is the, uh, the verse that Jesus is talking about after he just got done speaking to the Beatitudes, which is basically, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, et cetera, et cetera. So Jesus goes on and expands on this. Let's take a look at this verse, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. It says this. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So let's dig into this a little bit. In the first part of Jesus' words, he's speaking to his disciples, and he compares them and tells them to be the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? So let's take a look at the definition of saltiness to get a clearer picture of this. This is what being salt, being salty means. It means angry, irritated, or hostile. To undergo a sudden change of mood or outlook and to become annoyed or angry with someone. Now, I can tell already that I've lost you all. <laughs> that is what salty means nowadays. That's the slang term for salty. If somebody's salty, they're a little angry with you. So we could see how even today society has taken something and went, this is what it is. You're a little salty today. You're a little angry. You're a little annoyed. So I want to be clear before we get any comment cards, that is not what Jesus is saying, okay? Jesus is not saying that. Jesus uses the metaphor of salt to describe their function in the world, saying, you are the salt of the earth. And in Jesus' Jewish culture, salt had three uses. 
all of which apply here. First, salt was used as a seasoning for food. As a seasoning, the right amount of salt has the ability to draw out the full flavor and true taste of the food someone eats. It seasons it. Too much salt masks the flavor. If there is no salt, then the food is tasteless. But just, uh, just, just a little bit of salt enhances the flavor greatly. When Jesus told his disciples that they are the salt of the earth, he is telling them that though there are only a few of them, their godly lives will draw out the good in the world around them. They will enhance the flavor of God to the world around them. The second definition of salt is used as a preservative. In the days before refrigeration, salt kept food from spoiling before it could be consumed. As a preservative, the Old Testament uses salt as a metaphor for endurance, signifying the covenant between God and his people or his lasting covenant with King David. When Jesus told his disciples that you are the salt of the earth, he is telling them that their godly lives are the seasoning that preserves the goodness in society. And the third is Moses taught that salt was the key ingredient for the incense that burned before the altar. The incense was perfume, whose aroma was to be salted, pure, and holy. Likewise, the faithful lives of Jesus' followers are to be salt that is used to become the fragrance or the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who might perish. So salt had these three different things. They are seasoning that draws out what is good, they are the preservative that keeps what is good, and they are the ingredient that signifies what is holy and pleases God. So as believers, we need to stop and think, if we are called to be the salt of the earth, are we doing those things? Are we creating in our society around us the full flavor of God? Are we creating the aroma of God that just brings a sense of peace and joy and prosperity in things that draw people to God? But if the salt becomes tasteless and loses its saltiness, it does none of these things. Today's salt content has 97 to 99% sodium chloride. And pure sodium chloride, it doesn't spoil. But back in Jesus' days, it's very likely that the salt that uh, contained different compounds and different minerals in it because it came from the Dead Sea. And it might have been less than half sodium chloride. So if it was left out in the humidity, the sodium chloride would dissolve, leaving behind other minerals other than sodium chloride, and it would become useless. So it would decay. It would become nothing. It would just be used as something that might line the roads and people would trample upon. So in the same way as believers, as Christians, when we go out and we do things that aren't flavoring the world around us and causing people to see God, we start becoming useless in that way. We start losing our ability to enhance the flavor, the aroma, and preserve the goodness of God around us. When Jesus rhetorically asks, how can it made salty again? He's saying this, there is no way to fix it. There's no way to fix it. If you lose it, that's it. You're it. You're the disciples. If you lose that opportunity, if you lose that saltiness, you can't fix that. If you lose your saltiness, you become useless to serve as salt. You are no longer good for anything except for one thing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. That sounds pretty harsh, right? But see, Jesus challenged his disciples. He had 12 guys that went, hey guys, if you don't get it, this is it. This is what I need you to do. I've spent three years with you. This is what I need you to do. And so in a sense, when we look at this, not only is he speaking to the 12, but now he's speaking to all of his disciples. All of us that call ourselves believer in Christ, he's challenging us to be salt of the earth. Salt brings out goodness. When salt brings out goodness, we're effective. When we as believers bring out goodness, we are effective. But if we lose our salt, we are not effective at all. We can cause more harm than good. So what does it all mean? How does it apply to me? Jesus tells us that as his followers, we are the salt of the earth. We have this task of making others encounter the full flavor of God. Each and every day, in our everyday lives, no matter who we are, we have the opportunity to enhance the full flavor of God in the lives around us. So let me ask you this question. 
What kind of taste do you leave in the mouths of the people around you? What kind of taste do you leave in the mouths of people around you? If we are the ingredient that enhances the flavor of God in the world around us, what kind of taste do you leave in the mouths of people around you? Do you go through your day thinking anything like that? When you wake up, do you think, how am I going to leave a good taste in people's mouths? How am I going to be a good fragrance to those around me? I know it's hard for me. I know it's difficult, and that's, and that's the rub. That's where the enemy wants to constantly battle because God is calling us to be good, to be flavor, and the enemy's going, I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to trip you up. I'm going to get you angry. I'm going to put words in your mouth and in your mind that you say those. So what do we say? What do we do to those we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis? What kind of taste do we leave in the mouths of people around us? Now, I'm going to get a little real for a second. I can see what kind of taste we leave in the mouths of people on social media. And this kind of ties in a little bit to what Chris spoke about when he introduced the song. Great song, right? Great song. Amen? That was birthed out of COVID. Chris touched on some of those things. Sometimes when things get rough, it draws out things in us. And I'm being real when I say this. This is the challenge for us this morning. What kind of taste do we leave in the mouths of people on social media? See, here's the reality. Social media is pretty dangerous because it used to be I'll talk with you and we may not get along, but now I'm blasting you on Facebook or Instagram or wherever and everybody sees it. So now all of a sudden they don't even know you, but they're like, oh, I saw her in the store. I'm not going to talk to her, right? And then what we do is we end up having these dividing lines that happen and we start to up each other and those dividing lines came out in COVID. Now, I'm not trying to get political, I'm just trying to get real. If we're believers in Christ, and we're to be examples to those around us as salt and leaving good flavors, hear me out, does it really matter? Does it really matter that we press send when we don't agree with somebody about a political thing or about a mask thing or about this or that? Because the second we blast someone, this is what happens. Again, I'm one of the pastors on staff here. <laughs> I start seeing it. Oh, that person goes to South Valley. That person goes to South Valley. That person goes to South Valley. What kind of taste are we leaving in the mouths of people around us? So here is a key principle that I want to build off of today. Being salt does have the ingredient of talking about evangelizing, telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. But it, be, it begins with this. To be salt, it requires healthy relationships. To be salt, it requires healthy relationships. Now, maybe you're similar to me, and I told you when we started here that I'm going to kind of take a little bit of a different turn. I used to look at this verse primarily as being an evangelistic verse. I'm to go out into the world and help people find Jesus, and there's a component to that. Evangelism means going out, sharing the good news with people, being a good example to people, so there's an element to that verse. However, it doesn't start with that. We start with relationships. How will you impact the lives of those around you by being salt? Because sometimes as believers, we get excited and we go out and we don't even know someone and maybe Holy Spirit prompts us to tell them about Jesus or to invite them to church and that's all good. But sometimes we can take matters in our own hand when we come on so strong, we don't even know the person. We start judging the person. We go, hey, do you know Jesus? If you don't know Jesus, you might be going to hell. You know that, right? Whoa, whoa, time out. What kind of taste are we leaving in people's mouths? If I build a relationship with somebody, they start understanding that I care about them. That's what Jesus did for us. When I start caring about someone and I start building a relationship with someone, then I can start talking to them about these things. And sometimes I don't even have to talk about it. Because if we're doing it right, they see how we're living. They're going, why are you so happy all the time? Well, I got Jesus. Who's Jesus? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. Right? How will we impact the lives of people around us? Now, there's evidence how salt is a metaphor for relationships. So I want to back it up a little bit. 
There's other parts in the Bible that tell us that salt is a metaphor for relationships. For instance, in 2 Chronicles 13 and in Numbers 18, there's reference to the covenant of salt. The covenant of salt was a meal that two people committing to a friendship would sit down and have together. It was a high salt content meal, and they would say basically that I want to be in your life. It represented them sitting down and what they wanted to be to each other. They would have this meal. They would have a covenant of salt. In the book of Numbers, God's covenant with the Aaronic priesthood is said to be a covenant of salt. In the second book of Chronicles, God's covenant with the Davidic kings of Israel is also described as a covenant of salt. Of salt most likely means that the covenant is a perpetual covenant because of the use of salt as a preservative, meaning that they are continuously in relationship with one another. The commandments regarding grain offerings in the book of Leviticus states, every offering of your grain that you bring shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from the grain offering. With all offerings, you shall offer salt. So we see this as a key ingredient. We see this as a metaphor, and I think that's how Jesus speaks. Jesus speaks in a way that not only do we see something at the surface level, but we go deeper with what Jesus is saying. And we're challenged with what Jesus is saying. This is evidence of what Jesus is drawing to when he tells his disciples that they are the salt of the earth. We are the salt to draw others into relationship with him by fostering relationships with those around us. So are relationships important? Do we think relationships are important? I think COVID again revealed something about that. And I think we're still working through that. Isolation's not a good thing. I mean, God saw that. It's not good for man to be alone, right? He created Eve. God created relationships as a core part of who we are. So consider these stats from 2021 Fortune magazine, a report that says this. More than a year ago, 60% of Americans reported feeling lonely, left out, poorly understood, or lacking companionship. 60%. Over half of Americans are in a continual, not a periodic, state of loneliness. Do you think that when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, do you think that he's charging you and I to go out and be those kind of people, making those covenant commitments to people so that their lives are not filled with loneliness, that maybe there's those 60% of people that need to know something more than just being isolated and alone. Maybe they need to know the love of Christ, the importance of community with a body of believers that are on the same page. In the time where we have more social media and ways to connect with each other, we see statistics that we are more isolated and more lonely than we ever have been in any other time in history. If you think that that effect of loneliness doesn't go beyond our minds, consider this. It's physiological also. It's not just a mental thing. It's a physical thing as well. 2015. Researchers looked at some things that would increase your likelihood of dying prematurely. Air pollution increases your likelihood of passing away early by 5%. Obesity by 20%. Excessive drinking by 30%. Loneliness, 45%. Loneliness, 45% increases the likelihood that you will die prematurely. So when we look at this verse, we're called to relationships because Jesus knew that relationships were important. Jesus was so serious about relationships that he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to be beaten beyond recognition. I'm going to be put on a cross and crucified. I'm going to go to the grave. I'm literally going to go to Hades for you, but I'm going to overcome it all Why? Because I want to restore a relationship with you and our Heavenly Father. That's how serious Jesus was about relationships. That's how serious God is about relationships. Now we see that example, and yet we see the world as a place that is getting worse and worse. It's falling apart. So we start clinging to our little group of friends, or we stay close with our friends at church, or we don't do things that challenge us, but we don't think about how we can create relationships outside of that. 
So here's what's kind of happened that I've seen. We talk, and Pastor Ricky alluded to it. We went through the book of Daniel, and he's talking about prophecy, and he's talking about these things are true. We know the Bible is true. We know the Bible is accurate, and we know what's going to happen. It's not a surprise. We know the world's going to get worse. We know that one day the Antichrist will rise up, and we know all these things. Yet for the most part, stereotypically, as believers, we get discouraged with the world around us. Oh, the world's falling apart. Can't believe this. Oh, look at this political thing. Can't believe that. Ugh. And that's how we walk around in society. So here's a wake-up call. It shouldn't surprise us. Yup. Guess what? I love Jesus, and I'm going to be the best example, and I'm going to build a relationship with that person, and I'm going to drag them up, and I'm going to help them out, and I'm going to be salt to the earth because we only have a limited amount of time to turn it around. Right? So we need to think, what taste are we leaving in the mouths of those around us? At the store? At our workplace? At our schools? In our college classes? Young people, some old people, during online video game sessions. <clears throat> what kind of taste do you be leaving in people's mouths? When we post that social media post, what are we doing? When you are going about your day-to-day, -day, you have opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, encounter after encounter to be salt, to build relationships. It doesn't take much. When you go through the checkout stand, just a smile, Hey, I hope you're having a great day. It's good to see you. Call them by their name. Hey, Sylvia, good to see you today. Thanks for helping me out. It surprises people. They're like, how do you know my name? You have a name tag, but it's good, okay? <laughs> if you need more evidence as to why it is the condition of our culture today that we are so isolated, I found this quote from a book, The Pursuit of Loneliness by Philip Slater. This is what it says. We seek a private house a private means of transportation, a private garden, a private laundry, and do-it-yourself skills of every kind. Our enormous technological advances seems to have set itself the task of making it unnecessary for one human being ever to ask anything of another human being in the course of going about his daily business. Sounds like our generation right now, right? Sounds like 2022, right? That was written in 1970. For over 50 years, over five decades, we have been going down a path leading to isolation. And that is exactly where the enemy wants us to be. Isolated and alone, because that's where the enemy can destroy each and every individual person. So the enemy wants to destroy your relationships. They want to destroy, he wants to destroy your connections because he knows how important they are. Our job is to be salt and light that brings them back into a relationship with Christ and with one another. Because if they know Jesus and they get planted in a community, a community of believers where we're all together and we're all being salt and we're all doing it right, then we're caring for one another and we're working together. We are in relationships and that is what's important to be able to draw out the full flavor of what God wants to do. But we're in a relationship epidemic right now. Why do you think it's so important to come to church? If you're watching online, we're, we're excited that you're, that you're watching online. We have that opportunity. If you can come to church, we'd love to have you come and be with us here. It, it is a different opportunity to be amongst one another and build relationships. Why do, we th why do you think that we make such an emphasis on being in a small group? Relationships. Why do we ask you to serve and to participate? It builds relationships. Friday night, we had a fifth quarter. Some of you served there and did things. It builds relationships with those high school kids. You're the salt that's flavoring what God is doing. Makes them start going, hmm, something's going on here at South Valley. Maybe I need to check it out. And again, this is the starting place for God's people. Church is the starting place of getting it right. We need to get on the same page. I've used this analogy before, but I think this is the huddle. This is where we come together, like a huddle in football, and we get it right, and then we go out into the world, and we make the play happen, right? But we can't just sit in a huddle all day long. How many of you would go to a professional football game if you just watched the team huddle all day? 
That would not be very exciting, right? So we have to go out and we have to build relationships outside of these walls. And again, this is the starting place for God's people. This is the starting place to be able to get it right. So look at your circle of friends. You look at your circle of influence. Who's your oikos? Who are those people on your inner circle? Are you challenging them to be salt? Are you challenging them to leave a positive taste in people's mouths? Or when you get together, do you just all complain about what's going on? Are you enhancing the flavor of God in the city of Lemoore, in the streets of Hanford, in Kings County? At your job, in your neighborhood, in your schools? What about your marriages? What about your kids? Your family? What kind of taste are you leaving in the mouths of those around you? Salt is critical analogy for relationships. In Mark 9.50 it says this, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Do you see the correlation? Being at peace with one another is connected to salt. Why? Because being at peace with one another is part of being in relationships with one another. Jesus starts here because there is a natural progression that he'll lead us to. And we'll see that in a couple minutes. Jesus is very serious about being salt in relationships around you, and that will lead to the next point. Here's another verse, Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Again, salt, because it's important on how you answer someone else. What flavor do you leave in their mouths? I'll be honest, it's hard. I don't keep it at the forefront of my mind all the time. But it is something that we need to get right. And I know that we get it right sometimes. So I want to give you some practical ways that you can exercise this. I want to give you some steps that might help you as you're trying to build this and turn this around. Number one, be present. Be available. Engage with those around you. Put your phone down, be present, practice mindfulness, be there. Allow God to use you in every encounter. Be at church as often as you can, but I challenge you to come to church with a mindset of who can I encounter today to be a little salt. Come with a provider mindset instead of coming with, I hope I get something out of this today. Come with an attitude of, I pray God will use me to enhance the flavor of today's service. Number two, be positive. Be positive. Have an open mind. Show grace and forgiveness. Jesus showed grace and forgiveness to us. How can I show grace and forgiveness and love to those around me? Now, to be clear, it's okay to have healthy boundaries. It's okay to have boundaries and set those markers. Healthy boundaries are a good thing. But we need to continue to strive for relationships and community in the body of Christ. And I've said it before, Satan doesn't need to do much work if God's people are just tearing each other apart. He just sits back and goes, yep, don't need to do much. That church over there, they are just tearing each other down. Number three, be safe. Bring peace. Create a safe environment. Help others walk to a place of restoration. Our prayer is to have South Valley be a place where we enhance the flavor and the fragrance of God, that we seek to welcome all those who want to come to South Valley, that we seek to build relationships with them, that we bring peace and safety to them when they come here. The other reality with salt is this. In order to, to add flavor in order to preserve, in order to be part of an offering and bring out the aroma, salt has to be in contact with those things. So the reality is you cannot be salt alone. It requires others to taste. It requires relationship and connections. Okay, so if we look at salt and we say that salt is what you leave in other people's mouths Light is the image you leave in other people's eyes and into their minds. So let's take a look at Matthew 5.14. 
You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So the second metaphor Jesus uses to describe the function of his disciples is light. Light illuminates. Light reveals what is there and shows the way. Light is opposite to darkness. It's a common metaphor throughout the Bible in the ancient world for goodness. When Jesus told his disciples, you are the light of the world, he's telling them that you are the beacons of truth that reveal the reality of God's goodness to the world. Jesus expands the light metaphor to a city on a hill which cannot be hidden. At nighttime, a city that is elevated on a hill is like a lamp that gives light to all who are in the house. It cannot be hidden. It is too large to cover with a shade. It is in full view for everyone to see. The city is a metaphor that adds community to the element of light. So we have relationships, and then relationships build into community. Those who live in God's kingdom and seek his standard for social harmony are a city whose citizens enjoy the life-giving blessings and unity of harmony. Its light is attractive and draws people to its warmth. So again, we see not only are we to live a life that allows others to see Jesus in a positive way, but we are to live a life in relationship, in community, as a body of believers so that God is revealed to those around us. But more and more, we live in isolation. To be a city means we are living together. It gives light to all in the house, not just one. Again, isolation is counter to that. And I believe that is one way that we are missing it. We become too busy. We become too scared. We become too angry, too frustrated, too hurt, too ashamed to foster relationships and to build community. So what does it mean to be light? John 1, 5 says this. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the shadows. When we look at the world and see the wickedness and the craziness and the darkness, our response should not be to retreat. Our response should be to go out and create light that pushes back the darkness and creates a comfortable place to draw people into relationship with Christ. More and more people are unable to engage in a way of mutual respect or conversations. You can't even talk with someone without offending someone nowadays. We battle one another on multiple fronts because we're holding on to things that create more and more polarization in our society. And it's okay to have beliefs and and thoughts and ideas, but as believers, we should hold on to God's word. We should hold on to the truth. Dare I say this, that sometimes our thoughts get clouded with other views and ideas that we hold on to that aren't the truth. How can we let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father if we aren't reflecting the image of Christ to the world? I want to give you this thought. To reflect an image, you have to have light. Imagine standing in front of a mirror in a completely dark room. What do you see in the mirror? Nothing. Darkness. There's no reflection because there is no light. But when light shines in the darkness, even a small amount of light, you begin to see a reflection. We see our world today and speak of how dark it's becoming. We get frustrated on how the world makes decisions. We see the walls pressing in on us and we get angry and frustrated. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light Jesus is speaking of. When the darkness presses in, we need to shine brighter. In Jesus' day, there was darkness all around him. The Jewish people were being persecuted. They were being crucified on a daily basis. The Roman Empire was a very brutal empire. But Jesus was about his father's work. He was the answer to that fallen world, and he is the answer to our fallen world. He didn't legislate his way to save us. He didn't rise to political power and have all the right political answers to save us. 
He humbled himself and sacrificed himself to restore relationships with everyone, including the people who crucified him. So he challenges us to be the light that draws people to him. Our hope isn't in political answers or political decisions. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. We need to be a reflection of that hope to those around us. When you are salt in people's lives, relationship and community happens in such a unique way. When you do it right, it's such a unique thing that the community around us happens and people are drawn to it. We shine our light. We're a city on a hill and everyone outside of us notices it. People begin to see the reflection of Jesus, the reflection of love and grace and peace. And they begin to get drawn to it because they want to know about it. They see something completely different than anything else that is offered in life, and they start going, how do I get that? The early church saw this. In Acts 2, it says the early church says they had everything in common together that they shared as anyone had need, and as a result of that, they had favor of all the people. All the people around saw the uniqueness of what they had. You are the example of God's goodness to the world. Just as one light A lamp hides its light by putting it under a basket, but rather puts it on the lampstand so that it gives light to all in the house. So you are to let your light shine before men in such a way that people take notice. They are to live in such a way that others may see their good works, not for the purpose of mistaking the servant for the king, but in such a way that others notice and give glory to the true king who is in heaven. Jesus' followers are to live in such a way and be such a light that other people can see God's goodness. So let me ask you this question. Are you shining or are you hiding? Maybe you've become angry. Maybe you've become cynical. I would challenge you to give it to God and ask him to use you in this next season of light, shine for him. Maybe you feel insignificant. Maybe you feel like you don't matter. How could God use me? I'm just uh, blank. Whatever it is, I'm just a custodian, I'm just a teacher, I'm retired, I'm messed up. You don't know what I've done. I've I've done some things. Well, guess what? Jesus paid it all for you. You matter to God. And you are very significant because there is only one you in this world. And there will only be one you ever in this world. So I challenge you to pray that God would restore you and use you to shine as only you can. So how will you shine? Here are some ways to help you shine. Be someone who doesn't live in darkness. Living in darkness doesn't happen because you trip up. Living in darkness happens because you give up. So if you've made some messes of things, turn it around. Don't live there. Bring it before God. Number two, be someone who helps guide people out of darkness. God can use you and your struggles to help others. God never wastes a hurt. Maybe there's things you've, you've lived through. You could take that and you can invest it in other people's lives. Do they know that you care for them more than you are disappointed in their actions? When you have those rough struggles in life, when you come across someone who's having it, you build that relationship, they start beginning to understand you care for them more than you are disappointed in them. It's been said this, that a person will remember how you made them feel far more than what you say. Do people know more about what you are for or what you're against? I think sometimes as a church, we get that backwards. We should be, we are for every person, finding a radical, saved life with Jesus Christ. We are for the power of God's healing life in relationships. We are God's power of overcoming addiction. We are for God's changing lives. Number three, be someone who lives in a way that inspires other people to give God credit. Acknowledge when we have messed up, acknowledge when we fall short, humble ourselves because sometimes humility is what it takes to acknowledge a failure, and it could be the brightest example of God in your life that anybody else can see. So I say all this because I think today, or maybe this week, we need to take spiritual inventory and kind of go, what am I doing? What am I saying? How am I living? Are we being salt? Are we being light? And it doesn't matter who you are or what you're doing. 
I want to show this example of how someone can make a difference by just one step of being salt and being light in someone's life. Instead of looking at what happened, instead of looking at the offense, instead of firing back, they pause and they go, I'm gonna look past that and I'm gonna extend salt, I'm gonna extend light, and I'm gonna help this person come out of the darkness and it can turn someone's life around. Take a look at the screens. When I was 16 years old, that was the last time that I was arrested. And at that time, we were, we were at an all-time low, I think, with our family. And at that time, we were living in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I am already a pretty big boy, six foot four, 200, maybe 20, 25 pounds. I had a very bad mustache. I had a chip on my shoulder. Fresh into this high school in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Freedom High School. I wanted to use the bathroom, but I didn't want to use the regular boys' bathroom because the boys' bathroom smelled like smoke and uh, all the other fun stuff that boys' bathrooms smell like. So I'd go into the teacher's lounge, and a teacher comes in. His name is Jody Swick, tough guy. He says, hey, you can't be in here. I kind of pause, look over my shoulder. Okay, I'll leave when I'm done. And I continue to wash my hands. I slowly uh, dry my hands and I walk by him and I kind of just looked at him. I walked by, he looked at me, didn't say a word, but he was fuming. Um, I went home that night and I felt bad. I just felt bad. The very next day, I found him and I went to see him in his class and I said, um, I said, uh, I just want to apologize for how I acted yesterday and I'm sorry. And I stuck my hand out. And he looked at my hand and looked at me, looked at my hand again. And he shook my hand. I'll never forget that shake. He wouldn't let it go. He said, I want you to do something for me. Yes? I want you to come out and play football for me. I said, okay. He said, all right. I have your word? Yeah, sure. You got my word. I didn't think much of it. I thought, okay, yeah. Play some football. Like playing football, sure, cool. And I went out and I, and I played football for, for Jody Swick and he was our head football coach and um, he became a, a father figure to me and a mentor. I fell in love with the game of football. My grades got better and I started getting recruited from every college across the country. College coaches would come in, you say, there he is, Dwayne Johnson. 6'4", 250, plays both sides of the ball, very aggressive. My thought process started to change. That's when I started thinking about goals and what I wanted to accomplish. And I love that man. I'll never forget the impact that he had in my life. And the reminder and my takeaway from that amazing relationship that I had was the empathy that he had for a punk kid who treated him so rudely and disrespectfully, he looked past that BS and said, I believe in you and I wanna turn you around. Oftentimes when I see kids and they have been labeled all oh, their punk kids, true, but there's good in them and we gotta see that potential and I enjoy that today, seeing the potential in kids just like he did, especially kids who are kind of wayward and I've been going through it. I know what it's like. Um, so thank you, Jody. Thank you, buddy. So start this week, invest in relationships. Who's in your oikos? Who's in your circle that you can invest in? Who's in your family or your workplace, your community that you need to invest in? Be present. Wherever you are, make yourself available in every encounter you have. No moment God has given you is accidental. No encounter is inconsequential. Be positive and bring peace. When you come into a room, there should be a sigh of relief of peace and positivity. Stop focusing on what is wrong around you and you need to be what is right around others. Resist living in darkness and help others out of darkness. Look past it and help others 
turn their lives around. Commit to living in such a way that inspires others to give God honor and glory. Valuing what can happen when you're obedient to God is what is important. When you are in his plan, when you are the salt that flavors and the preservative that gives good things to those around you, when you shine for him and reflect his love and grace. I wanna leave you with this quote by Diedrich Bonhoeffer, a 20th century theologian that said this, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. Your life as a Christian on how you live as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. So maybe today your first step is taking that first step of receiving Jesus into your heart. And I wanna let you know if that's what you wanna do, it's as simple as ABC. You admit that you're messed up, you admit that you're a sinner, that you're in the need of a savior. And we believe that God sent his son Jesus Christ to pay the ultimate price by his death on the cross. He defeated death and rose again, proving that he was the son of God. And we call upon his name, committing our life to Jesus Christ by asking him into our heart and wanting to live for him for the rest of our life. And if you want to have that prayer today, we're gonna to take a moment to pray together. And at the close of this time together, we're gonna to be singing these words and I want them to be words that challenge you, that make you pause and make you think about what God revealed here this morning. So what could I say and what could I do but offer this heart, O oh God, completely to you? I will stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered. All that I am is yours. And maybe this time today during that song, I wanna challenge you, I wanna invite you not only to stand and worship God, but to make a stand saying, I'm going to be light, I'm going to be salt, I'm going to make a difference, I'm gonna make an impact in the lives around me, I'm gonna turn it around, decide today to make an impact in the lives of those around you by being salt and light. Invest in relationships and draw those around you to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and we thank you for this time. We pray that as we lift our voices up, we would be reminded of the price you paid, of the relationship that you want with us, Lord. And I pray this morning that there, if there is even one here who doesn't have that relationship, if there is one here online who doesn't have that relationship, that as we pray these words, they would be drawn into your presence. They would say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I know that I've messed up. And I call upon your name now to repent from those sins, Lord. I call upon your name because I believe that you are Lord and Savior, that God sent you, Jesus Christ, to pay the ultimate price by dying on a cross and being raised again, coming out of the darkness of death, proving you were Son of God. I believe that with all my heart and I call upon your name to come into my heart today so that I can have a relationship with you. I want to live for you. Let you be Lord and Savior of my life. Lord, we pray this morning, not only for those lives that need to take that first step, Lord, but we pray for each and every heart here, each and every heart online, that we would be salt and light, that we would build relationships, that we would push back against the darkness, and we would make a difference in the world around us that we would draw people into relationship with you and that as believers who come and call South Valley their home, we would build such a community that we'd shine so bright that the rest of the city would see that there is something here that they want and that they desire and that they need and they would be drawn to you. So again, Lord, we are humbled. We come before you and we raise our voices and we call upon your name. In your name we pray, amen.